You're watching Coronavirus in Context. I'm Dr. John White, Chief Medical Officer at WebMD. Everyone is talking about testing as a solution to get back to work and reopen the country. But is testing all it's cracked up to be? What are the challenges? To answer these questions is my friend and guest, Dr. Eric Topol. He's Executive Vice President of Scripps Research and the Editor-in-Chief of Medscape. Dr. Topol, thanks for joining me. Great to be with you again. So everyone is saying that we need to do more testing, whether it's diagnostic testing or antibody testing, we can break it down. But what are your thoughts about the role of testing? You've been somewhat vocal uh, about it. Well, John, I think it's clear we do need uh, a big jump, exponential jump in testing. And I was part of the uh, Rockefeller Foundation report that was just issued yesterday where we actually called for scaling up from 1 million to 5 and to 30 million uh, tests a week. Right. They were so saying they'll that, have 3 million by June, which is not far off. Right. Well, we, we have barely uh, done that since starting 1 million, you know, mm -hmm. so we are, we're so far behind and this is a big problem. So the, even the 30 million a week is a compromise because you have 330 million people. And you, don't, you can't just think that you're going to do that once because a lot of people, of course, are going to come out with a negative test, but they could subsequently become positive, but whether it's for the virus or for the yeah. uh, antibody. So we have a problem with not being able to reach such a large number of people and also on a frequent basis. The other thing we have, John, is that the tests are not as good as we'd like for accuracy. We have a false negative problem for the virus. We have a largely a false positive problem for the antibody, but there's false everything. Yeah. You know, for both how, bad, how bad is it, do you think? Is it based on the prevalence of the disease in, in the population in terms of its positive predictive value and negative predictive value, those people who test positive, who are truly positive, et cetera? What, what do you think the number is? Some people are saying it's 70%. Is it that yeah. low? You're bringing up a really important point for the seropositive antibody test because the prevalence is so low, mm -hmm. probably you know 2% or something like that or, or lower, the chance of getting false positives are, are higher. Uh, for, the, for the virus um, uh, RNA test, the false negative rate could be as high as 25 to 30%. The other wow. key point on the testing is that there's so many different tests. You know, today we learned uh, from Yale of a saliva test would be mm -hmm. much more palatable than mm -hmm. an azopharyngeal swab yeah. that looks much better, in fact. Mm -hmm. But obviously, we need more data. And there's so many, there's over 90 antibody tests. And there, a lot of these are getting emergency use authorization from the FDA with limited data. And that doesn't help. So the, the key point there is we have too many people spread out all over the country. We have to test them frequently. And we have shakiness in the yeah. test. Now, with that background, mm -hmm. we need an other plan. Okay. We can't rely on testing. So in the Rockefeller report, um, there were three big initiatives. One is testing. Mm -hmm. Second is tracing, mm -hmm. contact tracing. And we don't have the labor force to do that. We need to have that. The third is digital surveillance. Mm -hmm. So the idea here is to use smartwatch, for example, that we have a big uh, successful app called Detect. Tell us and about that. that. Okay. Yeah, we launched that a, a few weeks ago. We have, um, you know, many thousands of people on it, and we're collecting resting heart rate. Now, resting heart rate goes up before fever. Mm -hmm. So we had already published uh, back in the Lancet Digital Health Journal mm -hmm. earlier this year that we could predict the flu before the CDC, uh, and, and, and at least it accurately. Mm -hmm. So the point being is that Resting heart rate is a really valuable marker. Yeah. And that's something that over 100 million Americans have a smartwatch or wrist uh, mm -hmm. heart rate detector. So if we got a large number of those uh, to use it and to be part of the app of Detect, which yeah. is uh, you know, an opt-in story that uh, all different types of smartwatches, doesn't have to be uh, Fitbit or Apple or any kind, uh, we could really get our arms around this. And that's just one tool, John. Uh, you could also go for body temperature, mm -hmm. but uh, smart to thermometer. measure on a, on a yeah. small scale. Yeah. And you mentioned contact tracing. There's talk about hiring 100,000 
uh, workers to do contact tracing. Is, is that realistic? You've been a big proponent of tech. Uh, and how yeah. does tech play into this? I mean, it's not one or the other, but where do you think we're going to get the biggest bang? Well, the digital contact tracing is attractive, that it uses the smartphone chirps and be able to alert people that they've been in contact. Yeah. Um, the only problem is um, Singapore has the most experience so far. And even with the direction uh, of the leadership of the country, there's relatively limited use and it doesn't it isn't clear, it isn't validated that it's as good as human contact mm -hmm. tracing. We want to see that work well. It, it's some way to supplement. The key point here, uh, uh, John, is that uh, we got this thing for the next year and a half or two years, and we need methods that don't rely on slowness mm -hmm. and don't rely only on uh, human capital, uh, right. labor force, because that takes a while to develop. It's very expensive. but have to say that, you know, the Google Apple program for digital contact tracing, which is supposed to start uh, in May, right? Uh, we have to get that validated. We have to do paired studies to show that it comes up with accuracy as good or better than human contact tracing, which yeah. is the gold standard. But don't we also have to get 60, 70 percent plus to opt in? That's hard to do for, for any type of, of app. Oh, right. So you Yes, you need a large proportion uh, of people willing to do it. You, it's not something you can mandate. Uh, there are obviously legitimate concerns about privacy, especially when you bring in the tech titans uh, to something like this. But you know, one thing I think, John, that's worth emphasizing, um, if it's validated, the chance of being able to get back to work in a pre-COVID-19 world, mm -hmm. people might trade off some temporary privacy compromise in order for everyone to try to restore the way life used to be. So these are the sorts of things we have to think about. But the tracing story, we're, we're not prepared for that at all, as you've pointed out, John. So testing, we're not prepared. Yeah. Tracing, we're not. The only thing we're prepared for is we got 100 million people out there with a smartwatch. Right. And all they have to do is get on the app and start yeah. to donate their data, and we can likely, I mean, we have to prove it, but we can likely pinpoint where clusters of people with resting heart rate elevation is starting to appear before an outbreak has gotten into any uh, significant extent. Dr. Topol, what are other countries doing better? You've been tweeting a bit about what's happening in Germany. What are the differences? Yeah, it's actually pretty remarkable, John. Uh, in Germany, they read uh, our paper in, in Lancet uh, about the the ability to predict flu from resting heart rate from a smartwatch. So they initiated a program and within uh, a matter of days, they now have over 300,000 German citizens who have donated their heart rate data continuously. Uh, and they're extremely uh, happy with this ability at essentially no cost to have digital surveillance uh, throughout Germany. Yeah. Uh, and they're going to keep building the number of people on it. So this is, I think, a very attractive, uh, alluring way that we can get our arms around it. Uh, and it, it, it happens immediately. Uh, in the U.S., we're fortunate. Over 100 million people have a smartwatch or mm -hmm. a wristband that gets heart rate data. So it could be quite valuable for us. Can we add a pulse ox to that so we get some sense of oxygenation? <laughs> Is there value there? Some of them are, you know, in, in terms of where we are in technology, it's amazing. Well, you're right. Uh, good point, John. So that some of the newer uh, Fitbits uh, and other watches do have uh, oxygen saturation mm -hmm. capability um, and some have validation. Uh, the, the problem is that if you start having drops in your oxygen saturation, you're much more likely to be symptomatic right. and have already uh, had um, some medical contact. Yeah. You know, we're trying to pick things up really early, but uh, you're bringing up another point, which is using digital surveillance to keep people out of the hospital. And, th and we need to be thinking about that, too, because yeah. hospital is not a place to go unless you really are, are pretty darn sick. But the problem with that, just to be clear, mm -hmm. we don't know, uh, we don't have algorithms to say it's yeah. safe to stay at home uh, because sometimes people suddenly, as Medscape has covered, 
it can be sudden demise. So we've got to also make sure we have that nailed as well. Okay. Eric, where do you feel we are on antibody testing today? Yeah. You referenced a little earlier challenges. You pointed out their emergency use authorization, not a true approval for most tests. There's really only about three or so that have truly been approved. There are lower standards of accuracy. So are, are we there on antibody testing or should we not get too excited about it right now in these certificates of immunity some people are talking about? Actually, that goes back to Germany with this immunity certificate, but that is flawed to some extent. And first point is no one has a good serology test that's been fully validated. The problem is there's four other coronaviruses that can cause common colds, and some people have high titers of uh, antibodies, IgG, to those coronaviruses that cross-react to the uh, coronavirus of interest, COVID-19. So we have false positive problems. It's a delicate assay. Um, there's over 90 of them. That, that none of them have had you know, uh, validation at scale. Mm -hmm. And so the other issues are, let's say you have a test that's 100% accurate, which doesn't exist yet. Yeah. Then you have, okay, how long does that protection last? Oh, by the way, if you have antibodies, could you still spread? Mm -hmm. uh, oh, by the way, could you, might you reactivate uh, mm -hmm. or potentially even reinfection, although that hasn't been clearly demonstrated. So even if we had assurance that the test was fully accurate, we still have lots of unknowns about it and we have to fess up about it. So just because you say, oh, you have a positive antibody test, mm -hmm. well, it's not just zero one. Some people have very low levels of IgG against COVID-19. Some have very high levels. So, you know, it, this is a, a full of holes right now. And you're always very practical. So let's be practical if we can for, you know, our, our last minute. So Rockefeller Report, you talk about we need to do more testing and better testing, whether it's antibody testing, diagnostic testing, whatever. We need to do better contact tracing, whether it's hiring people, or using tech. And then we need to have these digital tools, which in some ways is surveillance and also help with diagnosis. We can't do all three well. And you know, there's some element of resources. I, I wanna kind of get your thoughts on where do we need to be spending more of our efforts? Not that other two aren't important, but if you had to focus more on one, where would it be? Would it be kind of on these digital tools? Because that's- Yeah, I, I think they've about. been grossly underemphasized. And the reason I say that is in the Rockefeller uh, panel of 20 some uh, experts, uh, none of them were particularly interested in the digital side. They were just arguing more about how many tests. But frankly, it, you know, we recognize that it would take six months to get to 30 million tests a week. We can do the digital surveillance tomorrow if we had you know uh, a national support and it's cheap relative to heart rate by the, by smartwatches is quite accurate and again it isn't at the individual level we're looking for clusters of people mm -hmm. where their heart rate is changing resting so i am actually a proponent of that uh but you know i don't want to dismiss that the testing at scale frequently sure uh, and the you know both antibody and virus uh, diagnostic and the contact tracing, these are all important. The, the critical issue, John, is we got so far behind this pandemic in the US and now we're playing catch up and there's no great strategy. All the things we're talking about are, are really uh, difficult. The easiest one is, hey, you got a smartwatch? If you don't have one, we'll send you one. Um, but let's get that heart rate data. It works quickly, it's passive. There's nobody sticking a swab up your nose. You know, it's, it's pretty, pretty straightforward. Okay. And that's a good point. And we can learn more about Detect at, at the site. So thank you, Dr. Topol. Hey, thank you. It's great to talk with you again, John. And thank you for watching Coronavirus in Context. I'm Dr. John White.